The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment by Jeremiah Burroughs Chapter 1 Christian Contentment Described I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content Philippians chapter 4 verse 11 This text contains a very timely cordial to revive the drooping spirits of the saints in these sad and sinking times for the hour of temptation has already come upon all the world to try the inhabitants of the earth. In particular, this is the day of Jacob's trouble in our own bowels. Our great apostle holds forth experimentally in this gospel text the very life and soul of all practical divinity. In it we may plainly read his own proficiency in the school of Christ, and what lesson every Christian who would prove the power and growth of godliness in his own soul must necessarily learn from him. These words are brought in by Paul as a clear argument to persuade the Philippians that he did not seek after great things in the world, and that he sought not theirs but them. He did not long for great wealth. His heart was taken up with better things. I do not speak, he says, in respect of want, for whether I have or have not, my heart is fully satisfied. I have enough. I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I have learned contentment in every condition is a great art, a spiritual mystery. It is to be learned, and to be learned as a mystery. And so in verse 12 he affirms, quote, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed. The word which is translated instructed is derived from the word that signifies mystery. It is just as if he had said, I have learned the mystery of this business. Contentment is to be learned as a great mystery, and those who are thoroughly trained in this art, which is like Samson's riddle to a natural man, have learned a deep mystery. I have learned it. I do not have to learn it now, nor did I have the art at first. I have attained it, though with much ado, and now, by the grace of God, I have become the master of this art. In whatsoever state I am, the word state is not in the original, but simply in what I am, that is, in whatever concerns or befalls me whether I have little or nothing at all, therewith to be content. The word rendered content here has great elegance and fullness of meaning in the original. In the strict sense, it is only attributed to God, who has styled himself, quote, God all-sufficient, in that he rests fully satisfied in and with himself alone. But he is pleased freely to communicate his fullness to the creature, so that from God in Christ the saints receive, quote, grace for grace, John chapter 1 verse 16. As a result, there is in them the same grace that is in Christ, according to their measure. In this sense, Paul says, I have a self-sufficiency, which is what the word means. But has Paul got a self-sufficiency, you will say? How are we sufficient of ourselves? Our apostle affirms in another case, quote, that we are not sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Therefore his meaning must be, I find a sufficiency of satisfaction in my own heart, through the grace of Christ that is in me. Though I have not outward comforts and worldly conveniences to supply my necessities, yet I have a sufficient portion between Christ and my soul abundantly to satisfy me in every condition. This interpretation agrees with that place. Quote, a good man is satisfied from himself. Proverbs chapter 14, 14. And also, with what Paul avers of himself in another place, that, quote, though he had nothing, yet he possessed all things. Because he had a right to the covenant and promise, which virtually contains everything, and an interest in Christ, the fountain and good of all, it is no marvel that he said that in whatsoever state he was in, he was content. Thus you have the true interpretation of the text. I shall not make any division of the words, because I take them only to promote that one most necessary duty, namely, quieting and comforting the hearts of God's people 
under the troubles and changes they meet within these heart-shaking times. The doctrinal conclusion briefly is this, that to be well skilled in the mystery of Christian contentment is the duty, glory, and excellence of a Christian. This evangelical truth is held forth sufficiently in the scripture, yet we may take one or two more parallel places to confirm it. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 6 and 8, you find expressed both the duty and the glory of it, quote, having food and raiment. He says in verse 8, quote, let us be therewith content. There is the duty, but godliness with contentment is great gain, verse 6. There is the glory and excellence of it, as if to suggest that godliness were not gain except contentment be with it. The same exhortation you have in Hebrews, quote, let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5. I do not find any apostle or writer of scripture who deals so much with this spiritual mystery of contentment as this our apostle has done throughout his epistles. To explain and prove the above conclusion I shall endeavor to demonstrate four things. 1. The nature of this Christian contentment. What is it? 2. The art and mystery of it. 3. What lessons must be learned to bring the heart to contentment? 4. Wherein the glorious excellence of this grace chiefly consists. I offer the following description. Christian contentment is that sweet, inward, quiet, gracious frame of spirit which freely submits to and delights in God's wise and fatherly disposal in every condition. I shall break open this description, for it is a box of precious ointment, and very comforting and useful for troubled hearts, in troubled times and conditions. Part 1. Contentment is a sweet, inward heart thing. It is a work of the Spirit indoors. It is not only that we do not seek to help ourselves by outward violence, or that we forbear from discontented and murmuring expressions with perverse words and bearing against God and others, but it is the inward submission of the heart. Quote, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. Psalm chapter 62 verse 1. And quote, My soul wait thou only upon God. Verse 5. So it is in your Bibles, but the words may be translated as correctly. Quote, my soul, be thou silent unto God. Hold thy peace, O my soul. Not only must the tongue hold its peace, the soul must be silent. Many may sit silently, refraining from discontented expressions, yet inwardly they are bursting with discontent. This shows a complicated disorder and great perversity in their hearts, and notwithstanding their outward silence, God hears the peevish fretful language of their souls. A shoe may be smooth and neat outside while inside it pinches the flesh. Outwardly, there may be a great calmness and stillness, yet within amazing confusion, bitterness, disturbance, and vexation. Some people are so weak that they cannot restrain the unrest of their spirits, but in words and behavior they reveal what woeful disturbances there are within. Their spirits are like the raging sea, casting forth nothing but mire and dirt, and troublesome not only to themselves but also to all with whom they live. Others, however, are able to restrain such disorders of the heart, as Judas did when he betrayed Christ with a kiss, but even so they boil inwardly and eat away like a canker. So David speaks of some whose words are sweeter than honey and butter, and yet have war in their hearts. In another place he says, quote, while I kept silence, my bones waxed old. In the same way, these people, while there is a serene calm upon their tongues, have blustering storms upon their spirits, and while they keep silence, their hearts are troubled and even worn away with anguish and vexation. They have peace and quiet outwardly, but within war, from the unruly and turbulent workings of their heart. If the attainment of true contentment 
were as easy as keeping quiet outwardly, it would not need much learning. It might be had with less strength and skill than an apostle possessed, yea, less than any ordinary Christian has or may have. Therefore, there is certainly more to it than can be attained by common gifts and the ordinary power of reason, which often bridle nature. It is a business of the heart. Part 2. It is the quiet of the heart. All is sedate and still there. That you may understand this better, I would add that this quiet, gracious frame of spirit is not opposed to certain things. Section 1. To a due sense of affliction. God gives his people leave to be sensible of what they suffer. Christ does not say, quote, Do not count as a cross what is a cross. He says, quote, Take up your cross daily. It is like physical health.